Kita, a graduating senior from the Sinus College, and already a, a research mathematician who will speak about our mathematician analog of Jesus theorem and ghost series. So, um, thank you. Uh, like you said, I'm, I'm Colin Spina from our Science College, and I'm going to talk a little bit about over partitions um, and specifically uh, what we call ghost series in regard to Bersuit's theorem. Um, so, I guess briefly, uh, I don't know how familiar you all are with partitions, but uh, we can't really do over partition work or any of this work without partitions. They kind of form the, the groundwork of what we're doing. So, I'll talk a little bit about partitions, uh, give you a brief uh, overview of what they are, and then I'll talk about a specific set of identities called the Rogers Ramanujan identities, um, as well as, um, so you might have noticed on the slide, we talk about a motivated proof, and I'll talk a little bit about what a motivated proof is and what makes it so uh, special and important to our research. Uh, next, I'll introduce the uh, idea of overpartitions, which you'll see are very similar to regular partitions. Uh, then I'm going to talk about our motivated proof um, and how that is related to the, uh, the general motivated proof from before. And then I'll talk about uh, these things called ghost series. Um, if this talk was you know, a couple months ago, close to Halloween, it might have made a little more sense. But you know what? We'll talk about ghost series and also these prime series as well. And then I'll talk about the identities that kind of fall out, because um, we were talking about Pursuit's theorem, and that plays a role with uh, partition identities, and we're talking about over-partition identities um, that are similar. And lastly, uh, we'll talk about what's going on in the future with this. So first, uh, I'll start with the definition of partition. So we have um, that if we, if we take any integer n, any positive integer n, uh, we say that, the, the parti that a partition of n is a tuple, um, lambda equal to h sub 1 all the way to h sub k, where we have n is equal to the sum of all of the numbers in the partition. Um, and order doesn't matter, so um, 1 plus 2 is the same as 2 plus 1. Um, now, uh, some notational stuff, each hi is called a part, and it's a positive integer. There's no negative integers because otherwise things kind of get haphazard and we can do whatever we want them. Um, the next thing is another notational thing. We say p of n is the number of partitions of n. Um, so now, I'll, we'll go through an example to try and illustrate this point. So if we have n is equal to 5, we want to look at all of the ways we can write 5 in terms of sums of uh, non-increasing numbers. So we have 5 is equal to 5, uh, four is e uh, 5 is equal to 4 plus 1, 5 is equal to 3 plus 2, 3 plus 1 plus 1, all the way down to a string of 5 consecutive ones. Right? So we see that we have been able to decompose this 5 into a sum of smaller integers. Um, now, what we can say then is since there are seven different ways of writing this 5 in terms of sums of other numbers, we can say that p of 5, or the number of partitions of 5, is 7. Um, so now, we want to generalize this. I mean, we like generalizing things, and it's kind of time consuming to obviously write down all of those. Uh, iterations of numbers there. So what we want to look at is a, a generating function which generates these over parti oh, sorry these partitions. Um, so we look at, at, at this uh, this generating function, right? We have a sum side and the product side, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what each of those are. So um, if we consider q as a, as a formal variable, right, we can start to expand this. So if, if we look at the product side, right, we notice that this looks a lot like a geometric series, right? And we know that a geometric series can be expanded in such a way. Right? If we treat Q as a form of variable, we can do this. Um, now, in general, right, because we have it raised to the K there, in general, we can say that uh, 1 over 1 minus Q to the K expands like this. Now, this product, we're just going to rewrite it in terms of the sum of consecutive Ks. Um, and this will play into how this generates partitions. Because if we think of it in terms of 4K, that doesn't necessarily illustrate the idea of the partitions as clearly as this. So now, if we, consider, if we continue to consider this idea, right, we want to figure out what is the application to, to numbers, right, and to partitions in general. So if we examine just this, these first few um, chunks, basically, of this infinite product, uh, where the, we have Qs to the first power, second power, third power, fourth power, and fifth power, um, and if we start to multiply things out, right, if, if we want to consider the coefficient of Q to the fifth, for example, so this guy here, once we multiply this all out, um, we'll find that there's a number of different ways to do so. We can form q to the fifth by taking just q to the fifth times one times one times one times one and all of the other um, uh, expansions there. We can also say that it's q to the fourth times q to the first. Right? So there's another one. We can also say it's three uh, q to the third times q squared. Similarly, q to the third times q plus one plus one. 
And all the way down, we have the rest of these as well, right? So we see we have all of these different ways of forming cubes of fifth by uh, multiplying these cubes together, right? So since we have seven of those different ways of forming q to the fifth, we can say that the coefficient of q to the fifth is seven. So we have that p of five, or the number of positions of five, is seven. Um, so in general, right, it, when we consider this, right, um, we can say that the coefficient of q to the n is, is p to the n. So like we said before, the coefficient of q to the fifth is p of five, or the number of partitions of five. Um, now we can manipulate the form of k and impose certain conditions on these parts. And what I mean by that is, um, you notice that when we expanded uh, the, this, this side of the, uh, the generating function, this side here, we saw that we were basically multiplying out and adding the exponents together, which is um, kind of intuitive in, that, in, in a sense. So we can, if we change the, the form of k, we can start to arrive at uh, different forms of these partitions. The parts have different, have specific characteristics. So if, for example, we were to set the k equal to 2k plus 1, right, we would have partitions, of the part, uh, partitions with parts that are strictly odd because we're only generating numbers that are odd in that case, right? And then similarly, if we leave it in the form that it is, right, with some, well, we can, we can also restrict it so that way it has strictly distinct parts, right? Now, what's interesting is that if we impose these two conditions on the generating functions, and we would compare the number of partitions with strictly odd parts and strictly distinct parts, they would be the same, which is kind of counterintuitive, or not necessarily counterintuitive, just not obvious, right? Why would odd parts in a partition, the number of odd uh, summons of a number, be the same as the distinct ones, right? But, in fact, they are equal, and that's true for in, in general with all partitions. And this is called Euler's identity. Um, and the proof of that is actually pretty, pretty cool, pretty straightforward, and, and we're not going to go through that one. But, um, but a more interesting set of partition identities, and ones that are used for a lot of uh, work in further partition studies, are the Rogers-Ramanujan identities. Uh, and the first Rogers-Ramanujan identity says, says the following. So it says the number of integers of an integer n, the number of partitions of an integer n, congruent to plus or minus one mod five, uh, is equal to the number of partitions of n such that the difference between consecutive parts is, uh, is at, least, at least two. <laughs> so, in other words, if we have parts that are either one or four, right, that's equal to the number of parts, uh, the number of partitions in which all parts are uh, separated by at least two. Um, uh, that's the first condition. The second condition is a similar looking condition where we say the number of partitions of an integer n um, where the parts are of the form plus or minus 2 mod 5 is equal to the number of partitions of n such that each part is greater than 1 and the difference between consecutive parts is uh, 2. Right? So this way um, we're guaranteeing that all parts are at least 2, so they're all bigger than 1, and that the difference between consecutive parts is at least 2. Um, and then notice we just have a plus or minus 2 mod 5 instead of a plus or minus 1. Um, and an important thing to notice about this, and, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, is that there's this modular component, right? And then there's also the difference component that pops up in both. And that is going to lead into the idea of the motivated proof, and, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, so uh, how this would look, right, because I said that we could manipulate the, the k value on the product side of the equation uh, to, to start to form these identities. Um, and, and something, the way this, this generating function would look like for this identity uh, is something like this. So we have the sum side over here is equal to this. And notice we just took the modular form and, and implanted that there for the k, right? And that's going to impose the conditions on our, our partitions, our parts, that all the parts are of that form. Uh, similarly, the second, the second one looks like this. Uh, we have the plus or minus 2 in this case here. Um, so we see that. Um, if, when we impose these conditions on the product side, we can generate these unique identities. Um, so, like I said, the, the, the modular component and then the difference component of the rogers ramanujan identities were kind of foundational in the study of partitions in that it led to a, a brand new avenue, basically. And that was kind of pioneered by the work of uh, George Andrews and R.J. Baxter. Uh, from here on, I'll just call them A.B. because it's shorter. <laughs> um, so they, they provided a different 
approach to this, to the proof of the Rogers Ramanujan identities, um, by way of what they call the motivated proof. And um, you might be asking, what is a motivated proof exactly? And that's a good question because, I mean, I, I mean, initially, I wasn't sure, and it actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. So. Um, originally, the question was raised to these two math or just mathematicians in general, and these two kind of took up the challenge of whether uh, mathematicians could prove the sum side conditions of the Rogers Ramanujan, and in other words, the difference two conditions, right, the bottom two conditions of the Rogers Ramanujan identities that I had up there, while knowing only the product side, while only knowing the modular conditions. Um, so, in essence, they, they prove what they called an empirical hypothesis. So, they collect a bunch of empirical data which suggested certain patterns in these, uh, that were created by these generating functions. And um, in proving this empirical hypothesis, uh, they were able to recover the sum side of the identities. So they started with the product side and, gener and recovered the sum side, which, which proved the identities, which was pretty interesting. So the, the idea of the motivation was really that they were you know, explicitly motivated by a question of whether or not they could do this. And in general, the idea of a motivated proof has taken on a different shape through the years. I mean, um, we're not necessarily motivated by the same question, just more so the general style, the approach to the proof, where we start with the product side and try and arrive at the sum side. And also, um, there are certain characteristics of the motivated proof that we like to make sure stay true to the proof that we're doing. And that's, that's part of the reason these ghost series came into play that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so the, the, the term motivated now refers more so to the general style of proof. Um, so, and if we take a look at back at these two Rogers Ramanujan identities, just to reiterate, um, basically, mathematicians were encouraged to see if they could use just these two conditions to prove these conditions. Because if we think about it, right, it might be a little bit, um, it might make a little bit of sense to think, well, clear, like, if, if we started, for example, with these two conditions, right, it, it might be a little, it might be, more straightforward to see that going the other way, starting with these and going toward the modular condition, it, it might seem a little more straightforward. But going the other way is not necessarily as intuitive. Um, is that clear in some way? So I think if we take a look at uh, some, some of the, the next couple slides, it might become a little bit clearer. Um, so if we take a look at these two series, right? So notice that this is just the, the first Rogers Ramanujan identity representation, right? And this is the second one, the product side representation. So again, they're starting with these and trying to get back to the sum side in some sense. So what they did is they called this one G1, they called it a series G1, and this one a formal series G2. And what they did from there is they, they realized empirically, and this is where the empirical hypothesis comes into play. What they realized is that when you take the difference of G1 and G2, their difference is actually divisible by Q, which is, which is actually quite interesting because the right number of terms drop off and we're left with a, power, a, a series that starts with Q, and then we divide out that Q and we're left with a one plus another string of Qs to a power. And so that works out nicely, and they realize that empirically. And in general, right, they realize that, uh, so this G1 over G, sorry, this G1 minus G2 over Q, right, yields another formal power series. And they called that G3. And from there, right, they were able to generalize this even further. So they saw, OK, well, if I take the difference of these two, these first two series uh, represented by the Raja Ramanujan product sides, and we take the difference, I get another formal series. And after they verified that this was true empirically, right, they, they were able to say further that if they take the difference of, so this G2, that they use to find G3, and they take the difference of G2 and G3, and so divide that, yes? And I suppose that this, there was a definition of G3, what I mean very fine. So they found out an explicit expression for G3? For, it seems for G3? To me that oh. They define G3 as G1, G1 and G2 of the yes. So what do you mean very fine? So they came up with an explicit expression for G3 that they did not show us? So they were able to, um, oh, that's a good question. So they, they took the difference of these two series, right, the two well-defined series that we had before, and when they divided by Q, um, 
the division was acceptable, right? And then they didn't, I, I'm not sure if they rigorously defined a G3 in terms of the, in the forms like this. Is that what you're asking, if they defined a series that looked like this? Yeah, but right now I think that you define G3 mm -hmm. to be G1 and G2 of a Q. Yes. So, to, to verify it by definition. So, does that make sense? I, I think Unless you came up with an alternative. So the, the definition of G3 is this, but the, the empirical thing was what they started doing is creating this G45 and listing the, co or listing the coefficients and seeing that it was always 1 plus a bunch oh. of zeros and then Q going out. Oh, so the verification was the business by Q. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and so and to that point, that the empirical hypothesis is going is to pop up in the next couple of slides, where we're going to see exactly what uh, what, what pattern these these uh, series satisfy, what they what they, what pattern they have, which will make it uh, easier to see how, how the verification process works. Um, so, so like I said, so what they realize as well is that when they take the difference of any consecutive two term, any two consecutive series, they're divisible by yet another power of Q, a pure power of Q. So like G2 minus G3 is divisible by Q squared. And that we're going to call a new series G4, which starts 1 plus Q to the power. Similarly for, G, uh, for G3 minus G4, that's divisible by Q to the third, and we get a G5, another series, and so on and so forth. And this, and this continued on, this pattern continued on. And each of these G, G sub i's, just G4, G5, G6, so on, are all formal series. Um, and in general, they found, they found this to be true. They found that if you take any G sub i, so in this case we have i is equal to 6, it's equal to G sub i minus 2, so G4, minus G sub i minus 1, so G5, over Q to the i minus 2, so in this case Q to the fourth. Right? And, and this is true for i greater than or equal to 3, so for basically starting with G3 all the way onward. Right? And G1 and G2, again, are just the product side representations of the rogers romano John identities. Right? So if we take this form up here, right? we have G1, over G, G1 minus G2 over Q, and that's equal to G3. If we just manipulate that and rewrite that to be something that looks like this, if we write G1 in terms of G2 and G3, in terms of subsequent series, right? If we bring the Q to the other side and just manipulate, we have the G1 is equal to G2 plus Q times G3. Now, but we also know that subsequent series can be written in terms of series that follow, right? For example, we know that G2 can be written in terms of G3 and G4. So what we do next is we, well, <laughs> we do what I just said. And then uh, basically now we have a, uh, an equation in terms of or we have an equation for G2, and what we can do is we can substitute this guy in for G2. And when we do so, right, we, we put G2 in there, and now we see we have two G3s, so we can start to group. And when we group those things, right, we see that we have now a 1 plus Q times G3, and then a Q squared times G4. And then if we continue, right, well, we know that G3 can be written in terms of subsequent series. We know it can be written in terms of uh, G4 and G5. So we can plug those in, just as we did in terms of for, G, uh, for G2, and then we have something that looks like this, and then again we can group because we have two G4s. And we see now that we have this right here, we have 1 plus Q plus Q squared times G4, and then this right here as well. And what we're noticing, right, is that we have a, a, uh, a term here, right, that starts 1 plus Q to a power times a series, times an infinite series here. And then another set of, of Q's to a power without the one times another series, right? And this is going to be, this, this, this recursion that's popping up here is going to be formative for the empirical hypothesis that we're going to see pop up in a second. So in general, right, and this is what I was saying, so in general, each of these G sub i's, if we think back to this right here, we have this G1 can be written in terms of, like I said, a 1 plus Q to a power string of Q's and then times of a series which again starts 1 plus q to a power, and then q to a power times another series starting 1 plus q to a power. And in general, what they realized, right, or in general, the, um, we have here that any g sub i, so any g that you pick, can be written in terms of, again, uh, a series starting 1 plus q to 1 plus q to a power times another series starting 1 plus q to a power, times a string of q's, 
times another series starting 1 plus 2 to a power. And again, we have here just the, the, the definitions of uh, each of these, right? And this was uh, derived through empirical collection of data that they realized that um, this is the representation of each of these uh, series that they have here. Um, so, in general, right, this leads to the empirical hypothesis which George Andrews and R.J. Baxter sought to prove in terms, uh, to, to recover the sum side of their identities, right? So, the empirical hypothesis is, if, again, if we think back to what we had before, right, we have that each G sub i can be written in terms of, um, uh, so the product of these start 1 plus 2 to a power, and this side starts with just 2 to a power. And what we realize is that all g sub i can be written in, in such a way where we have 1 plus q times another um, power series uh, with non-negative coefficients. Right? And this is, goes back to the verification question. We know that each of these g sub i are well defined in this regard because they start in this form. They start 1 plus 2 to a power times another uh, power series. So, if we again consider, consider this equation, right, and, and the proof of their empirical hypothesis was actually, was actually pretty, um, pretty succinct, it was, that, it was very brief in that, or not brief, just very uh, clear in that if we take a look at this, right, and we want to consider this as our i terms get bigger, as our, uh, in this case, in, in term, as our l's or iotas get bigger, right, uh, we want to make sure this generalizes. So we take the limit as uh, it approaches infinity, right, and what we realize is that this term here, well, we can't really quantify it, we just have this a sub infinity, right? And we see here that this term approaches 1, and then the q's to a the, this, the polynomial strictly q's to a power goes to 0. And then furthermore, this one also approaches 1 just as this one did, right? And then just as we multiply this out, we see that the limit of this whole function as it approaches, as it approaches infinity is actually equal to this a sub infinity, right? And the a sub infinity um, is a little bit abstract, but what it helped to identify, um, and this follows from the fact that in addition to the g sub 1, the g sub 2 also works, right? And it works for all g sub i, meaning that all of these g sub i have the same limit as, um, as the iota approaches infinity, as the subscript approaches infinity, as, as the subscript approaches infinity, right? Um, so, when, when we get this here, this, that a sub i is the, is the factor that gives us our sum side of these identities. So we started with the product side, and we did this manipulation of this, this empirical, um, uh, we proved this empirical hypothesis, which in turn led to the recovery of the sum side of these identities. Um, so, this was taken a step further by, um, Jim Lepowski, who you guys might know, and, um, and his collaborator, Zhu. Um, so they considered the, the Gordon Andrews identities, which is another set of uh, partition identities, um, which have product sides that, that, look, that look like this. So we have um, all the conditions are written down here instead of being up in, this, in, the, in the exponent. But basically, they have this, uh, this set of conditions on the parts in these partitions, right? And, and George Andrews, I'm sorry, uh, Jim Lepowski and Ju um, considered this set of identities, right? And, and they wanted to think about it in terms of the motivated proof, as did uh, R.J. Baxter and George Andrews. So in general, right, they define each of the G sub i in the same spirit of Andrews and Baxter to look something like this. So there's a whole complicated mess of subscripts here, but basically, the idea is still true of the original motivated proof in that we have a series defined in terms of other series as well, right? other um, subsequent series, divided by a pure power of Q. Yeah? I guess you should point out also that the series at the top of that product is the G sub 1 through G sub K. Those are the G sub I's that we started. Right, yeah. So, um, so yeah, like, like you were just saying, this, this is the G sub I's that we started with in the in the previous um, Andrews and Baxter proof. They generalized the work of Andrews and Baxter. So this, this product side here is equal to each of the G sub i's that we had from before. So uh, 
Further, uh, to continue the generalization of the Andrews Baxter uh, paper uh, work, uh, Lepowski and Zhu um, proved that this, the G sub uh, K minus 1 times J plus I from before, satisfied a similar empirical hypothesis. Namely, their empirical hypothesis looked like this. And again, you can see the similarities to the previous empirical hypothesis. There are just some um, alterations in the exponents. Basically, now we start with 1 plus Q to a different power times another, another uh, form of power series. Um, and the, the proof was very similar um, in that they, they took the limit as this thing approached infinity and they saw that a similar thing fell out, which indicated that uh, the sum side was then recovered. Um, so this, the motivated proof um, this whole structure, specifically the Andrews Baxter and Lepowski Zhu papers, were the kind of the foundation for the work that is proceeding. So all of this work was predicated on the, the, the subject of partitions, right? Just the breaking down of integers into some smaller integers. Now, what we considered was a slightly different set of numbers. Instead of partitions, we considered something very similar called overpartitions. So what overpartitions are? is basically it's the set of all regular partitions of n number n. But we have the option of overlining the first occurrence of any of the numbers in the partition. So an example is uh, if we take n is equal to 3, right? So, uh, and again, notationally, we call p bar of n um, the number of over partitions of n, right? So if we take n equals 3, um, this might become a little bit more illuminating. So we have here 3 is equal to 3. And then we also have the option of overlining the first occurrence of that 3. So we have 3 is equal to 3, and 3 is also equal to 3 bar. Similarly, we have the standard partition 3 is equal to 2 plus 1, but we can also overline the first 2, and we can also overline the 1, or we can overline both, the first occurrence of each of these. Right? And we can see in this, this uh, final over partition here, we have the option of overlining the first one, but we can't overline any of the other ones after we've overlined the 1. So we can see here that, that the partitions of a number 3 are all in the over partition. They're very similar, just now there's more basically to consider and then there's more factors to consider in terms of the, in terms of the identities, right? Um, so we can say that the over partitions of 3 is equal to 8. Yes? Uh, can you motivate the study of over partitions? I mean, partitions seem like something that a, a combinatorialist or a general mathematician would be interested in, but this, this, this sort of seems like a weird little curly cue that you're putting onto it for some not so clear reason. Yeah, no, and that, it absolutely can be motivated in the same way as, as partitions, and that's actually uh, the focus of, of the research that we were doing. We basically, um, let me see if this is the next slide. So basically, uh, we can look at a similar form of the product side of the partition of the over partitions that we did for the regular partitions, and then we can motivate it in a similar way. And we're actually going to talk about that in, in a couple of seconds. Um, now I see what Jake asked, what is good for the partition is natural, but that's taking uh, out I see. the Jupiter future. Um, as, I mean, as far as I know, um, the. Yeah, I mean, it is just artificial, and I don't know quite what the application is, because I know that the partitions have uh, applications to other, other fields, like uh, vertex algebra theory and things like that, but I'm not sure if the over partitions so, have representations. Over partition looking expressions like this that did not have to be into the vertex algebra stuff, but we were, we were also motivated by the papers by Corti uh, Olympia and the, the work that they used. So maybe the motivation you get nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose, yeah, that's probably the, the main goal. <laughs> um, so, um, we, can, we can generate these, like I was just saying, we can generate these in a similar way. Um, so we have that the generating function for over partitions is nearly identical to the generating functions for standard partitions. Q to the pi n is missing. I'm sorry? Q to the pi n is missing. Oh, yes. <laughs> You're right. Um, that should be there. So, what, uh, there should be a, a Q to a power here. I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so we have that, uh, with the exception of the Q to the power that's missing, we have that um, the sum size, so the number of partitions of n, um, we can generate that by looking at this product uh, of over partitions of n. We can look at this infinite product over here, where we have the 
the original representation for the product side of partitions, just with the added caveat that we have this 1 plus Q to the K. And this 1 plus Q to the K on top is what's giving us our additional part being added into the mix. Um, 